Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Dr. Nick. My name is Dr. Nick Schmidlkofer, and I work for the Neurologic Wellness Institute here in downtown Chicago. And on today's episode, we're going to answer the question, what is misophonia? And misophonia is a relatively newly diagnosed condition, um, although it may not be new in the sense of uh, people haven't had it in the past, but it's now a newly recognized, newly diagnosed uh, condition. And it is a neurological disorder. And what happens is that people that with misophonia, and it's generally kids at first, or you get it in, in childhood, are going to have this abnormal sense, abnormal reaction to a uh, specific sound or pattern of sounds. And this abnormal reaction is like this strong anger and annoyance towards this sound. And this feeling feels like the person feels like they can't get away from it. And so they need to step away so they can't hear it. Um, they need to find strategies to maybe, maybe like close their ears, put headphones on. Um, it can be a very debilitating condition that prevents them from living their life the way they like to, especially socially around family, friends, uh, maybe in school, like especially in lunch rooms. Uh, and it's just, it's very debilitating for this individual. Generally, like I said, you see it in childhood more, um, but some people don't realize they have it necessarily until they're, they're older and then they find out that there's actually a, a name for this condition. So <clears throat> misophonia, we're gonna talk um, I'm going to look through a paper here that's um, somewhat new. Like I said, it's a, it's a relatively new condition. And then we'll talk about a little area of the brain that we can work on to improve it. So let's go right to this paper. And it's called Misophonia, uh, Current Perspectives to Neuropsychiatric Disease and Treatment. And it's from 2015. Okay, so... Like I said before, misophonia is characterized by a negative reaction to a sound with a specific pattern and meaning to that given individual, okay? So the abstract just kind of talks about a couple different things, but we're going to go right into the paper. Um, so with, with sound problems, people that have uh, difficulty with sound, it could be um, hyperacusis. Hyperacusis means that somebody hears sounds louder than they are. So this really isn't a hyperacusis. Uh, people, people aren't hearing sounds that are super loud. Now these, these specific sounds that they don't like may be a problem, okay? Again, these specific sounds, I didn't mention it, but it could be like uh, chewing or uh, chewing on an apple with something that's crunchy or slurping, anything with the mouth, so like lip smacking. Uh, it could also be related to like pen clicking, like a repetitive sound like that. It could be trains or cars going by uh, there there's a lot of factors there's a lot of possibilities and we'll kind of talk about them here at the bottom um, and so but hyperacusis is just this intensity thing it's this is not misophonia uh, so misophonia right here again is present when abnormally strong reaction occurs to a sound with a specific pattern or meaning to an individual and or meaning with the context in which the sound is presented it's frequently playing as a role so some people, if it's like a specific context of like the lunchroom, kids don't like school and um, someone sitting next to them is constantly chewing, right? Or uh, again, context in a classroom and the, the teacher is constantly pen clicking. Um, that could have that strong emotional reaction versus maybe pen clicking outside at recess has, has no effect on this, on this child. Um, these, this strong emotional reaction brings on autonomic arousal and unpleasant emotional experiences such as anxiety in response to these sounds. So it can bring on like rage, sound rage um, towards these, towards these uh, sounds and therefore the, the child can't focus in school or, or in other things, can't focus in conversations. Okay, so here are the sounds. Again, they're mostly trivial but like things like gum popping, food chewing or crunching, no sniffling, as I just did, breathing, pen clicking, clock ticking, whistling, lip smacking, finger or foot tapping. Uh, if this isn't just an annoyance. This Remember, this is a, this is a like emotional, anxious annoyance 
rage um, producing. Can there be a spectrum of this? Yes, possibly. But for the most part, this is, this is produced at a young age and it may get worse as it goes on if we don't treat it. Other trigger sounds, like I said before, were like train um, or an airplane, distant sounds of engines, maybe sounds made by animals. So uh, for instance, like a dog, you know, licking, licking um, its paws can be, can be something that could be a trigger. Okay, so the thing with this, you, know, you have these physical manifestations that occur too. So not only the emotional response, we get these physiological manifestations. So right here can be described with accompanying psychological reactions, right? The tightness or pain in the chest in someone's arms, uh, increased muscular tone, diaphoresis, which is sweating, uh, may just increase sweating, dyspnea, problems breathing, tachycardia, increased heart rate, hypertension or high blood pressure, and hyperthermia, which is like feeling of, of heating up, right? Um, or overheating. And so all of that can be produced just by these trivial sounds because this person just has a, um, a poor sense or a poor reaction to these sounds. I'm gonna show you what happens in the brain uh, with that here in a second. So feelings of reaction, talk about that. It could be at work or it affects their school, work, family, social domains. Okay, I wanna talk about the six criteria because this is important. So six criteria, number one is the presence of anticipation of a specific sound, presence of anticipation of a specific sound produced by a human being, the eating sounds, breathing sounds, provokes an impulsive, aversive physical reaction which starts with an irritation or disgust that instantaneously becomes anger. Okay, so this says produced by a human being. Um, if you think you have misophonia, you may not react to me doing it right now because I'm on a video screen. But you also may react as well. So some people are all a little bit different. Some people it only happens when they're, the person's actually there in a specific context. Sometimes uh, you can react just by thinking about it. Um, and so that's, that's an important, important uh, aspect here. Uh, number two is this anger. Um, initiates profound sense of loss of self-control control, and then possibly aggressive outbursts. So again, this person feels trapped within themselves. Uh, loss of self-control. The person, number three, the person recognizes the anger disgust is excessive, unreasonable, or out of proportion to the circumstances or the provoking stressor. So again, the person knows that they shouldn't be reacting this way, uh, knows that the, the stressor really isn't a huge deal, but they can't control it. Okay. Number four, the person tends to avoid the situation. Uh, if, she, if he or she cannot avoid it, they'll endure the encounter with the mesophonic sound with intense discomfort, anger, and distress, or just disgust. So again, like if I had a patient who um, their, uh, her son and her daughter would be eating an apple and she would just leave the room, just completely leave the room. Now she's at a point where she can handle um, the, her, her son or daughter eating the apple, which is fantastic. Yes, it still annoys her, but she is to the point where she can look past it, she can work past it um, by activating uh, her prefrontal cortex, which we'll talk about here in a second. Number five, the person's anger, disgust, or avoidance causes significant distress um, or significant interference with day-to-day -day life. We talked about that. And then the person, number six, the person's anger, disgust, avoidance are not better explained by another disorder, such as obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, those kinds of things, okay? So, but at the same time, I do wanna say that this disorder is possibly related to obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, uh, tic, tics or Tourette's, because of this like feeling of bottling up inside, just like what happens with tics and Tourette's. So that happens, and they compare that later here, right here in the, um, in the article. So, We'll talk about the treatments here in a sec, but first I wanna to go to this photo here. So this picture is just a picture of someone's brain with showing their prefrontal cortex here in the front of the brain. So right here behind the, uh, the frontal bone, behind the forehead. And then the limbic system is deep in the brain. The limbic brain is very deep. Um, you have parts of the brain like the thalamus and the basal ganglia that are more midline. And then the hippocampus, which the hippocampus has to do with memory. 
and then the amygdala is right at the tip of that hippocampus. That has to do with emotional memory or fear memory. And so this is really important so that we can understand what causes us fear and what we may need to avoid in the future. Because if something is scary, we don't want to go towards it. We don't want to have that danger. Um, but there are connections in here that become too much. They become too plastic as um, maybe early on in childhood, the, the individual, the child uh, has this sense of uh, emotional reaction to, to somebody chewing and it just kind of builds and builds and builds to where the, this emotional brain just is firing without control. And that fire enough control gives that sense of anger, that sense of disgust, sense of annoyance and anxiety, where the child or, or the individual cannot focus. Um, and if one can't focus, one can't do anything besides just sit there and listen to this, this feeling of, or sit there and listen in agony with this feeling. And so again, this limbic brain is the fight or flight freeze response. Um, emotions are living here. What's cool with the prefrontal cortex is we have the ability to control this limbic brain. The prefrontal cortex does a lot of functions, deal with empathy, insight, response, flexibility, emotional regulation. So that's one we'll talk about. Body regulation, morality, intuition, attuned communication, and fear modulation. So those are the two I really want to talk about, are emotional regulation and fear modulation. So this prefrontal cortex, which is our executive function, our higher order thinking, what makes us human, we have strong connections from here to the amygdala. So we have the ability to say, you know, this sound is, is trivial. This sound is not annoying. Um, and it, it's that I'm making that sound super easy. It's definitely not easy for these patients, but it is something that we can train. We can induce positive plasticity onto this area um, to where we can kind of inhibit that habit loop that occurs when we, when, our patients hear these, these poor sounds. So that's one way that we can treat it, okay? Um, if we go back to the article, we have um, the, the treatment approaches, right? One treatment is specifically avoiding. We don't want our patients necessarily to avoid these situations because that can lead to uh, a lot of social distress, right? Um, afraid to go to dinner parties because don't know if they'll have to leave the situation and be able to handle it. Um, Obviously, earplugs, headsets, music, things to kind of cancel out the sound. A lot of times, if it's a chewing thing, the patient, if they're chewing, they don't, they don't care, but it's somebody else chewing those sounds that, that become the problem. Um, other things, so the exposure and response prevention. So basically, continuing to get exposure to this stressful sound and then working on preventing it. So basically, working on different tasks uh, prefrontal cortex wise in order to have a little bit of exposure, but then be able to not be too anxious or feel like they're in that, that bubble where they can't escape, uh, to be able to move and get out of it. And the other thing, which is, uh, so we have some medications here. The other thing I don't know where it is now was biofeedback. Um, so it is in the table up here. We have behavioral strategies we just talked about, but other treatment like biofeedback. So that is specifically like uh, having the sound, whether it's on a video or in real life, looking at someone's heart rate and then trying to just control the heart rate through breath, through breathing work, through controlling that rest and digest parasympathetic system. Um, so a lot of those are things that we'll do here in the office is training those areas, uh, constant exposure, but then trying to not necessarily distract the patient from the exposure, but to overcome it by focusing through it. So, um, so that's it for today. Um, mesophonia is one of those conditions that are relatively unique, but it is out there and a lot of people don't understand they have it, especially parents don't understand what's wrong with their kids if they have it. And so this is something that I hope everyone shares and shares with other people because uh, it's something that we can help these individuals, and it's better to help them early on in childhood. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please leave them below. Thanks again. Have a great day, and stay healthy.